Well, last week, as, as we go in this series, we uh, follow me, we talked about the four fishermen and how God called them to leave their nets, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and really gave that invitation to them and, and also that challenge to get up and follow him. And, and this week we have two more men, and uh, they're similar in some ways, and, and yet they're a little different, this call. So this is from Matthew 8, 18 to 22. Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another disciple said, said, said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Follow me, leave the dead to bury their own dead. Well, Jesus is still in Capernaum, here on the Sea of Galilee, and the crowds from last week to this week have grown very large, a lot of people, multitudes, and because Jesus is doing these signs of his Messiahship, he's healing, he's taking authority over evil, and word is spreading. Like I said last week, Capernaum is a very strategically located place. There's a lot of traffic coming through there, so word of him spreads in, in Galilee. And, and here uh, we see the different ways that the word disciple is used in this. Uh, first, I want to call us our attention to that. Sometimes the word disciple means the 12, and that's the common way that we think of it, become a disciple of Jesus. Well, you're one of the 12 disciples, men chosen by Jesus to live with him for three years, to follow in his path. They, every day they were together, they learned what Jesus knew and then carried on. Their mission was to carry on in his name in the same way that he had once that he had left. Then we see this, this broader circle of at least 70 or 72, uh, depending on your translation, disciples that we have. And, and these 72, remember there's, there's instance in, in the Gospels where they're sent out two by two in his name. Uh, they, he gives them authority. They do the same thing that he does. So they're not just, uh, you know, hearers and bystanders, but they are uh, following after him. They are imitating him. They are in the ministry of Jesus. And then there's a broader uh, way that disciples is used, a larger group, many more. Uh, some of them undoubtedly kind of occasional followers where they, they came for some days and then went home and, and kind of in and out, but, but they're, they're listening, they're, they're imitating, they're obeying him as they can. And uh, let's not assume that, that all were the same. The word is used in, in these at least three different ways. But Luke records uh, as well that there were some women that followed Jesus. And a group of women who supported him financially and spiritually. And we find this group of women uh, that at the end are there at the cross. And the twelve scatter. And the women are there at the cross. And they're also there on Resurrection Sunday. And so in the early church, there's a group also. It's not just all men, but there's a group of women that are following him and pursuing him, imitating him, obeying him. Now, this is a, a radical call of what Jesus makes to these guys. Uh, the scribe approaches Jesus and makes a statement that he's going to follow him everywhere. And anywhere you go, Jesus, I'll go with you. And scribes were men were, who were highly educated. They were teachers of the law. They interpreted the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. These were the educated men. They had a high social status, probably a high economic level. Okay? And uh, this scribe is among the greater number of those who are listening to Jesus uh, as disciples. They're observing how he lives, observing how he heals. And the scribe... This, this man of fairly high stature in their culture is so taken with him, he says, Jesus, I'm with you. Anywhere you're going, I'm with you, you know. And, you know, I, I think for this, the first thing I noticed was informative as to what Jesus doesn't say to him. Because I think if someone came to one of us and said, I, I want to join you, we'd go, wow, that's great. I can really use you. Come on. And, you know, or, you know, we, we don't have any scribes with the gifts like you have. And we'll, we'll, you'll be a great addition 
to our team, and you know you can try it, see how you like it. If if you don't like it, well, that's okay, you know. But give it a try for a while, and we'd give a real loose kind of entry and a real easy kind of exit to you know. But just just try it out, you know. Come for a while, see how you do, you know. And Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't encourage him at all. Uh, he doesn't really invite this man. He challenges this man. He says. In essence, if you follow me, uh, I want you to realize you're going to be homeless. Have you thought about that, Mr. Scribe, Mr., you know, live in a nice house, got a good job, everybody thinks a lot of you. Have you thought about that, Mr. Scribe, that you may end up homeless because I'm homeless, is what Jesus says. You know, the birds have nests, the foxes have holes, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So you may take a, a downward spiral economically and socially you might you might think that you're taking an internship that's going to look nice in your resume but who you're throwing your hat in with you see is a rather radical leader in Jesus and this is not going to go well for you on your resume as a matter of fact people at some time will look at you and go oh you were one of them radical call then there's this other man who says lord let me first go bury my father and Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Well, now, excuse me, that's just not nice, is it? I mean, to talk to people that way. That's the way it sounds. I mean, really. Uh, and, and we know there's more here than what we get in this short account because the duty to take care of one's parents is pretty clear in the Old Testament. Honor your father and your mother. That's pretty clear. And, and the, the Jewish tradition and the law said that you were responsible as a son to take care especially of a death of a parent, you know. Yeah, that's commanded in Scripture. And some have tried to soften this to say, well, really what the man is saying, my father's sick, so let me stay at home with him until he dies, and, and then that'll be another season where I can follow. And, and even that doesn't cover this because, you know, the call to follow Jesus means that nothing I think, comes before the kingdom of God. And that's radical. And there's this urgency to this, this call. Follow me now, is what he says. You know, the next season of life isn't when I'm calling you, I'm calling you now. Following is not just something that we do on our timetable. You know, well, we'll work it out and, and I'll get everything the way that I want it. Then when my life is just pretty well ready and I'm secure, then I'll be able to give you my time and my all. Never is that the call of God on our lives. Exactly the opposite. But there's this kind of ultimate nature to it. I want everything, and it's now. There's urgency to it. We throw the word disciple around kind of loosely. We use the word follower in the same manner, and that's the way it is in Scripture. Disciple and follower, there are a couple of words in that group, and they, they, they essentially mean the same thing. But we use, I think, really four words that I think of. We say, I'm a Christian believer, I'm a disciple, I'm a follower. I'm Christian, I'm a believer, I'm a disciple, I'm a follower. And we use them kind of as the same thing, you know, uh, today in our culture. And uh, I don't want to get real picky here, but our language and our culture, I, I want to make the distinction between these four words. We use the word follower and disciple to mean the same thing, and they essentially do mean the same thing. But when we say Christian, we may not mean the same thing. We may say, I'm a Christian, meaning I check that box on the application, or I check that box when they check me into the ER, and that's the box that I put down Christian, kind of like I would Caucasian or African American or Chinese or Kentuckian, right? That's just who I am. I'm a Christian, yes. I fall into that, that big category. And you know the word Christian isn't used in Scripture much at all. Um, it was kind of a late adaptation. It's not in the Gospels. It means little Christ is what it means. But it may mean something different for us. And then we say, I'm a believer, and uh, you know, the word believer in our culture is a rather generic term as well. People say, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, I believe in reincarnation, and I believe in aliens. And that's all the same person, you know. And we go, well, okay, 
you know. So for someone to say, I'm a believer, may not mean much today. It, it just means they believe in something, okay. And to understand what Jesus is saying here, I think we have to understand what he means when he calls people to follow him or be his disciples. Disciples not only believe, but they live for him. Uh, they're believers who have decided that the, the status quo of their spiritual lives, uh, that's not good enough, and, and they want more, and they, in spite of the cost, that's what it means to be a disciple, to be a follower. So that's what we mean, and Jesus meant when he said follow. Now, Jesus gives the, the uh, scribe some information that he's missing. Jesus uh, fills him in on what it means to follow him anywhere and everywhere. And Jesus is, in essence, saying, you're biting off more than what you can chew. We use that expression, right? You know, or you say your eyes are bigger than your stomach to little kids that get the big plate and they can't eat it all. And, you know, it's uh, the mixed metaphors. Um, you can't finish what you're starting. Um, I took a picture of this house. It's over in Tuscany. There's a couple of them, I think, left over there. And um, this foundation has been there at least since 2006. And, uh, you know, one of the saddest things is to see someone start a house and then not be able to finish it. Every once in a while you'll see one of the skeletons that's around town of somebody that starts to build something and they had such high dreams and they had, you know, such aspirations and we can do this. And then maybe there's just a few walls or some leaning rafters. This guy just had a foundation. It probably was a builder, you know, that went belly up in 2008. I hope it wasn't a family. But isn't that one of the saddest things is to see somebody try to start something and then they bit off more than what they could chew. They didn't exactly know what they were getting into. And we remember back, ooh, in the company of a few bankers here, we, we, we remember back in, in 2006 or 2005 that people were saying things like, well, I know that I must be able to afford it because the bank has given me the loan, right? Hopefully we've learned that that's not the test to whether we can do this or not as to whether someone will loan us the money. But people said that a lot. I know that it, God must want me to do this because the bank said I could do it and they gave me the loan. Well, you know, sometimes we, we underestimate the actual cost. I, I ran across just a few things. Fam famous cost overrun Suez Canal, 20 times as much as the earlier estimate. 20 times. I mean, what part in that canal do you stop digging? Runs over 20 times. Uh, the Concorde uh, airplane costs 12 times more than predicted. Uh, Boston's big dig tunnel, we, we, we all remember that, you know, went $11 billion over budget. $11 billion, you know. Uh, the channel between UK and France um, was over 80% more the construction cost and 140% financing cost overrun. What's good about all those overruns is that the taxpayers will pay for it, right? Yeah, we just don't worry about it. It's, it's government. They failed to grasp the scope of what they were doing, though. They just underestimate the magnitude of what they are undertaking. But they got it finished because it's government that's doing it. In our lives, we don't have the government to step in and say, you can walk this out. And that's in essence is what Jesus is saying to this young man, to this scribe, is that you don't know what you're saying. You, there's some miscommunication here. The scribe says anywhere. Jesus says, you're not going to have a home. You're going to take a step down or two or three or four on the social ladder here. You're going to get dirty. You're going to fall from being the one who's respected to be and admired to just being a follower of Jesus. There's your anywhere. And he warns him that he's committing to a future that he can't imagine. Now, I, I propose that we are admirers of Jesus, and there are fans of Jesus, and there are followers of Jesus. I, I guess a lot of us begin as admirers of Jesus, you know. He's right up there with Gandhi and uh, Martin Luther King, you know, and Adolf Rupp, 
right? You know, Jesus, they're all kind of, you know, like the, the Kentucky, uh, you know, Mount Rushmore, you know. And we go to hear him as much as we can, and he makes us feel good about ourselves, as long as it doesn't, you know, this is the admirer, as long as it doesn't change life too much or cost too much. He's, he's so smart and so kind, and he's just so Jesus. And, you know, we hear his words and we feel better. And then we may be fans of Jesus. Um, we, we begin to hang around some other fans, and we, we get T-shirts that got Jesus on it, and we talk about him some to some other fans, you know. And uh, he's way up there high on our priority list, at the top of the list for, you know, when we want to be entertained or pastime. Jesus is way up there. And we learn Jesus' language, and we talk like that sometimes when we're around other fans. I'm being very kind of mean, aren't I? I, th- I think a lot of us have been fans at times. And probably you, you went through the fan stage, and then there are Jesus followers. And they're, you know, they're just kind of weird and radical. Excuse me. They actually think they can imitate his life. They think, maybe not every second of every day, but they think that they can walk like Jesus walked, you know? They think that they can sometimes be nice to people who are mean to them. Uh, they don't take vengeance. Um, they give their lives away. They live like Jesus actually knows them and sometimes talks to them and tells them things. Okay? Um, they live their lives for someone else. Admirers, fans, followers. Now, as we go through this, these passages in Matthew, we, we, I think we have to remember that the focus of Jesus calling every would-be follower is the kingdom of God. It's all about the kingdom, or the kingdom of heaven, as Matthew calls it. Jesus began his ministry calling the people, it says, to repent. He said, for the kingdom of God is at hand, Matthew four seventeen. The reason I think we don't grasp the, the radical demands of Jesus and the, what he makes on his followers is because we don't really grasp what this kingdom is. Uh, Isaiah says, remember, he says, my ways are higher than your ways, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And I think the kingdom of God is just so much greater than what most of us, we kind of equate it with church, you know, and it's not church at all. This is so much greater than everything else. In short, the kingdom of God is heaven on earth. Now let that sink in for a minute. That's what he means. The kingdom of God is heaven on earth. The kingdom seems radical because it's life without the darkness and the effect of sin. Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand. Change. Turn around. It's time is what he's saying. It's life as God intends it to be. And Jesus says turn, repent. It's here now. Jesus told a lot of parables about the kingdom. And one of them is in Matthew 13, 44. And and this this one is just typical of some of the parables parables that he gives to try to give us an understanding of what what the kingdom is, what, what we're to follow into. And he says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has, and buys that field. I love that picture. I don't know what the guy's doing digging in somebody else's field, but that's kind of beside the point. We don't talk about that. But it's a man that finds this treasure in somebody else's field, and then he sells everything that he has, all of his possessions, to buy that field because that treasure is out there, and the treasure, Jesus says, is the kingdom of God. Have you ever found a treasure like that? Have you ever found anything in life that was so fantastic that you would just pay anything to have that? You know, I was thinking about this for myself. I think, well, there's been some small things, uh, you know, just moments. Maybe I didn't sell everything that I had, but there have been times where, you know, we, we sacrifice stuff in life. Maybe it's for a person, maybe it's for a job, maybe it's for a mission, maybe it's for something that just burns on your heart so much that you would literally, this, this becomes your treasure in life. This is what you think about all day. And Jesus says, that's the kingdom of God. Now, we're kind of talking in financial terms here, and I don't do that because 
and or excuse me, I do that because we must we must come to an understanding that putting Jesus in this life first is worth it. Okay, there's an equation here. This is worth it, all right? Because only when we have the kingdom of God in mind is giving our lives away worth it. And Jesus is saying, you know, this is such a great treasure. You can have heaven on earth. You, you, can, you can have, maybe, okay, not 24-7 maybe. Jesus did. We don't get 24-7. But, but we can have times where you are here on this earth and you have no fear. You have no anxiety. You have no pride. You have no lust. You have no discontentment. He says, that's heaven on earth. That's the kingdom of God. There's the treasure. Don't you want to go buy that field? (laughs) Just think, if you could never be afraid again, or, 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 or never, you know, want what somebody else is, to be content with life, never worry about something again. And Jesus is saying, it's the kingdom of God. Don't you want that treasure? Don't you want to go buy that field? And Luke, there's a, there's a similar passage to what we read today in Matthew 8. Only Luke records a little bit more of what goes on. It's the same scribe, and there's, a, and there's the same man with the family at home. And it means the same, only Luke says something, a tagline at the end of it from Jesus. And this is Luke 9, 57 to 62. This is after Jesus has talked to the scribe and then talked to the man. And Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now, you know, to be quite honest with you, I I looked at that for years and I thought, well, fit here means worthy. That's not what this word means here at all. It doesn't mean worthy at all. It means, you know, well-placed. Are useful. So he's saying, you know, the picture is of a plow, an old fashioned one bottom plow, a man walks behind behind an ox. And he says, if you're if you're grab a hold of this and then you're looking back all the time, you're not useful in the kingdom of God. Because you see, you've got you're trying to to live two lives at one time. You're 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 looking back, you're double minded, you're you're unstable, as Jesus' brother would say. You you just don't have you haven't given it all. You're still looking at family at home or, or you're, you know, like the scribe, you're looking at what you've lost. And he says, as long as you're doing that, you're not going to really get this treasure of the kingdom of God. You're not going to really ever have the lack of fear, or the lack of guilt, or the lack of anxiety. But you're always trying to live two ways, you know. And he says, you're just not useful. It just doesn't work. God offers us a life of heaven now every moment that we follow him and live in him. And actually, as 21st century Western Christians, we try to multitask this. That's, I mean, to talk in our language today, we, we try to multitask kingdom work like the scribe and, and the man with a sick father. And we can't multitask life in the spirit. It's either there or there. You can't do both at the same time. We can't plow and look back at the same time. We can't divide our ultimate purpose and mission in life, but we try. So maybe you think you can multitask. I don't know. I, I you know, we always think we do. We think we can read the Bible and watch TV at the t- same time, or we think that we can check our email, listen to our wife, or somebody else say, can't do it really. People take a lot of pride in being able to multitask. I can text and drive, and you know, then you learn all of a sudden that you can't do that. Stanford came out with a, a study on this. I think it's really insightful. They said, attention multitaskers, uh, quote, or uh, parentheses, if you can pay attention, that is. They say, your brain may be in trouble. The researchers set out to discover what gave multitaskers their special focus, allowing them to do multiple things at one time. And instead, they were surprised to discover that in many ways, multitasking impairs performance. You don't get more done. 
So while many people think they're effective at juggling multiple tasks, they're actually pretty lousy at everything. For instance, heavy multitaskers are suckers for distraction and for irrelevancy. According to the researcher, everything distracts them. Multitaskers were also more unorganized in their ability to keep and retrieve information. They were even worse at the main thing that defines multitasking, switching from one task to the next. Heavy multitaskers taskers, underperformed in almost every area of the study. So it, when we think, I can do all this at once, we're actually doing nothing better. <laughs> wow. Article based the study and concluded with this advice. By doing less, you might accomplish more. Single-mindedness, see. Isn't that really what Jesus is trying to tell these two guys? See, you got one focus here. It's the kingdom of God. It's not your social status. It's not even your family. Your family will be better off if you're focused on me. But it's just stay focused here. I mean, one wants to keep his position as a scribe, the rabbi, uh, who has given up the glory of heaven and, and saved the least of the world. And the other is just a great son, but he wants to have two ultimate missions in life. He wants to have his family and the kingdom of God. And you can't have two ultimate missions at once. You can only have one. And Jesus says you can't multitask your soul. You can't do that, you see. You guys just don't know what you're getting into. There's some days when I follow. There's some days when I'm just a fan. Um, I still believe, you know, I still believe, but my ultimate mission is not the kingdom of God. And, you know, my prayer, I want you to join me in my prayer today, if you would, if this is hit in accord with you. My prayer is that, Lord, show me your kingdom with such clarity that I want that treasure. Because I think that's what it's about. It's not, oh, you know, I've got to obey Jesus to go do this. It's not, oh, you know, this. I'm such a bad person, I need to change. No, the, the vision that we need is for what God wants to do here among people who really follow him to give you a lack of fear, a lack of pride, lack of anxiety, to give you love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. So, Lord, would you show me your kingdom? Let's, let's end with that. As deep cries out